Hello, Rory McKiernan here and welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. I'm coming to you from La Hinch in County Clare on the wild west coast of Ireland. I want to share this interview with you. It's not a typical episode. My usual episodes are roughly one hour interviews with inspirational people from around the world. More recently, I've been pretty busy launching my book straight into a global pandemic, which has been a very strange time, particularly when bookshops are closed. And there have been a lot of challenges. My UK book tour has been cancelled. My Irish book tour is cancelled. Now my US book tour is cancelled. Um, So I won't pretend that it hasn't been challenging in lots of ways, but thankfully people have got behind the book. It is getting out there into the world. People are ordering it online from Book Depository, Amazon, Irish sites like Debray, Eason's, Kenny's, Bookstation, uh, O'Mahony's, Waterstones, all the different websites are stocking it. You can find links at hitchingforhope.com. The book is part travel adventure, hitchhiking travel adventure, part memoir, part reflections and a manifesto for hope and healing during troubled times and dark times. And it's ultimately a book about hope. Um, I'm getting daily messages from readers and very grateful to receive them from people that saying it's striking a chord and resonating and there's something in it about the particular time. And a lot of people are commenting on what a strange time it is for the book to come out in in so many ways, a perfect time for the book. So those of you that have purchased it and, and read it and sent me messages, I really appreciate it. I also appreciate anybody that can offer reviews or testimonies on the likes of Amazon, Google Reads and Goodreads. They all matter. And really, the book is a community book and it's a community effort. And it's about community voice. It's about community power, community spirit. So your support, it really does matter. I don't take it for granted. And I really appreciate any messages, any feedback, all of that. Um, And if you have ideas of how to help promote and launch it in different countries, I'd very much welcome your view. So feel free to send me an email anytime. Um, You can get me through info at hitchingforhope.com. It's info at hitchingforhope.com. And a big thanks also to all the podcast patrons uh, who continue to support this podcast. So this episode is an interview that I did with uh, the legendary broadcaster Dave Fanning. It's on RTE. It's our national broadcaster here in Ireland uh, on the 2FM channel. It's roughly 18 or 20 minutes. It's mainly about Hitching for Hope, but also speaks to some of the the challenges and the reflections and thoughts that I have around the current time that we're in. And um, hopefully you'll enjoy and listen. Thanks again. And check out the book hitchingforhope.com and all support. Appreciate it. Thanks again. Now, Rory McKiernan is the founder of SpunOut.ie, a social entrepreneur. He was appointed to President Michael D. Higgins, Council of State. And a few years ago, he decided to hitchhike around Ireland just to, well, just to kind of listen to people. His new book, Hitching for Hope, documents that hitchhiking journey, the people he met along the way, and what he learned himself. And he joins me now. Rory, you're very welcome to the programme. How's it all going, first of all, with you, by the way? Are you self-isolating all the rest, yeah? Ah, uh, yeah, I think we're all in the same boat, Dave. Relatively, you know, and we're down in La Hinch, so we're not in a bad part of the world. My wife and I, and uh, plenty of green space around us in the sea and all. But yeah, we're taking all the the appropriate measures, but catching up and still be able to work as long as the internet works and yeah. reading and boning people and catching up and doing what we can, keeping okay, the heads well, look, in good let's order. Let's go back to 2013. The book is called Hitching for Hope. Why did you decide to head off hitching around Ireland? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd founded this organization, SpunOut.ie, youth organization. I'd built it up over several years working with some amazing people. And I was experiencing what might be called burnout. And I was just kind of flatlined. Energy was sapped. I was feeling down, somewhat depressed, in just a bit lost, to be honest, Dave, and um, decided to just jack it in and walk into the unknown. And I also walked straight into a recession and austerity, a lot of gloom, misery, despair, and was considering emigrating, quite frankly with tens of thousands of other people and but I kind of was started to reflect on what hope might look like for me what the future might look like for me and also I suppose there was a lot of anger uh, around 
politics and what kind of country we are and where and can be. And I just wanted to kind of connect with that. And I had an opportunity to speak at the McGill Summer School. And instead of just going up and speaking at it, I decided to go around the country hitchhiking and ask people what did they think about where hope might come from for ourselves in our own lives, but also for our country. And so it was kind of a personal pilgrimage in a sense but also a social experiment. Okay and you found a lot of good stuff, you found a lot of hope, you found a lot of very good kindness and all the rest of it but can I say first of all what kind of a world are we living in um, after you've done your journey? I mean there is anger there is hardship, there is injustice everywhere. Are we questioning it a lot or were we because of post 2008? Are you questioning it a lot or is that then and now it's now it's a different time now? Yeah, I think there's an uncanny similarity to where we're at in this present moment as we speak in terms of uncertainty, you know, and uh, there's a lot of things collapsing around us right now and a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of people thinking about their family, their finance, their health. And that was, you know, quite similar in the past. And Ireland has been through these kind of periods in the past, maybe not quite what it looks like right now, but our parents, our ancestors, uh, indeed ourselves, you know, every couple of decades, the country goes through a pretty profound challenge. And um, I think that was similar. And it, it, that kind of inspires a lot of existential questioning to some extent as to what your own values are, what are the things that are important to you. And I think we can all sort of relate to that at some level right now that we value our health, we value our friends, we mm. value our family, value good leadership, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, that was that was there's a big kind of theme running through it. It's about hope. It's about community, connection, people power, resilience, finding the spirit and the courage in yourself to forge through dark times. Okay, and well, look, hold on a second. Then. Look, it's, it's like the, 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 the hitching side of things, first of all. I mean, it is very different. You put up a Facebook page. You couldn't have done that when you were hitching back in your 20s. Do you think Ireland yeah, was cur- more community-based back then? I mean, I definitely feel as though I saw more hitching 20, 30 years ago than I have in the last five or six years. Ah, yeah. Well, there's look, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is our public transport has improved uh, somewhat. I don't know how much it has improved in certain places. But also, not everyone had a car when we were all growing up. And I think Ireland was slower, quieter, less populated in some yeah. ways. And pitch was just a practical means of getting around, particularly in rural Ireland, where I grew up in Cavan, in Coot Hill. And it was just a, a means of getting there to be. But there was a kind of a kindness and a decency in the culture and in the people where we were just looking after each other and if we saw someone needed a lift we'd give them a and lift listen, it wasn't uh, how how intrusive or invasive were you when you met people was it to glean things from them or was it just to have an yeah. old Irish chat or whatever I mean like you went with no plan you go spiddle in Galway and you have all these people from Moy Cullen to Gerard to Cleggan Damien Dempsey is there there's Mam Cross there's Westport there's the Reek there's the Rosary on top of the mountain etc were you just I'm going to get involved in things and I will just observe and take things from what people are saying either to me or to each other but I'm not going to get in the way and stick out a microphone under their nose yeah exactly um, yeah I wanted to take people as I found them and I wanted well I hoped that they would take me as they found me and just to connect as two human beings face to face or eye to eye and in fact when you're sitting in a car with a stranger you're not actually looking eye to eye, which is an interesting dynamic yeah, to it all, where yeah. you're just shoulder to shoulder. So people have a tendency to to open up a wee bit and and just say things they may not normally say, um, and just kind of there's a there's a kind of beauty to the moment if you if you like, and and sometimes people just need to share stories about things that have happened in their lives, and it could be sad things like somebody had lost a, a brother through a hit and run accident, and um, there was a lot of you know. I suppose, um, sadness in the family, but she spoke about how they kind of dealt with a lot of that. And people talked to me about divorces and separations. I talked to a farmer who was selling the last of his cattle and was considering emigrating, but he was on antidepressants and he wanted to hang on for his children. But then also had lots of crack and lots of hopeful stories about people fighting back and rebuilding and people's ideas for the country. So the book is a bit of a mashup and mix up of all the different stories, whether it be nuns and priests and monks and orange men and the presidents in it. And as you said, there's a bit of a demo Dempsey and there's all sorts in there. Yeah, and the, 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 like there's Sonny from Death Row and there's Irish speakers and there's politics and bees and traditional music and tidy towns and <laughs> everything else. And pretty yeah, miserable yeah. camping when it came to Tleggan actually or somewhere along the way there. And also yeah, like there was a lot of... Spot. Yeah, yeah, right, indeed. Uh, yeah, well, to be honest, most of it uh, had a kind of a very sunny, sunny oh, yeah. period. 
my back. So there was one night uh, where I got washed out of it in the rain and I ended up taking refuge the next morning, going into a hostel, a youth hostel. And uh, a fella called Brendan from Limerick, Brendan Kennedy, I hope he's listening. And he appeared out of nowhere and suddenly the coffee was on and the porridge was on and it was just it's a whole scene in the book where he was just like this angel from heaven that saved me from all this misery you know yeah, by the way Hitching for Hope is what we're talking about here we're talking about the book and Rory McKiernan wrote it and went around Ireland hitching and doing a bit more besides um, let's just talk about the great phrase the kindness of strangers did you meet it a lot? yeah look people would ask me to still to ask me and I, I look at I never set out to write a book first of all it was just people it seemed to tap into something and I did end up doing a TED talk a TEDx talk about it and so on and people were saying you should write all that down documented and I was I don't have time to write a book you know but I somehow pulled it off now it's strange that I've ended up launching it head first into this particular time that we're in but perhaps there's no accident in that now it, it's not necessarily helpful that bookshops are closed but thankfully Eason's and different shops are selling it online and and it's on hitchingforhope.com. Yeah. But back to the the hitching, the kindness, like I'd stick my thumb out and within five minutes, on average, maybe 10 minutes, sometimes I'd have a lift. And I just think kindness is implicit in the human condition. Now, some people say, well, not everyone. And yes, not everyone is kind in every moment of every day. But there is a core decency, a core humanity that ripples through us. And I think we need to celebrate that, augment it and amplify it. And that's the but call you know, of our something time. Like with social media, with kind of Facebooks and everything else, do you think that like, what, what, was the trip gaining notice? And did that give you fuel to keep going? Because people were now talking about it because they could read and see. Uh, yeah, it did. It did capture its people's attention. You know, I ended up firing up a Facebook page, and um, it did. It did, in fairness, get a fair bit of traction on Twitter or Facebook, all that crack. And then I ended up doing radio interviews, and then people end up in Cork, and someone said, "Oh, I heard you on the radio." This, that, and the other. But yeah. that. It was secondary, to be honest. You know, I wasn't really doing it for radio. Like, the, the beauty of that, in a sense, was that I was able to report back through radio, and radio is a powerful medium. I was able to report people's stories in real time and say, I met this person that day. And, you know, I felt there was a, a sense of advocacy in that, whereby I was able to relay stories that I felt needed to be heard, particularly when I would have felt personally that the leadership wasn't listening to the people. And, if I could be of some small service of relaying those stories out. And hopefully that's what I've tried to do in the book, where Hitching for Hope is, is this kind of collection of people's stories. It is, the collection of people's stories, most definitely. I just want to get up to the points where you went to Letter Kenny and Derry, etc., and then 12th of July. Um, you growing up near enough to the border, I suppose, Cavan, but what did the north of Ireland teach you? Or what did, for instance, the 12th of July, Orange March teach you? Yeah, the the lads from um, the Mark Patterson show on BBC Radio File uh, invited me on to chat about the trip. And then uh, the next day I ended up uh, on an orange march with them and, and speaking as part of, of an outside uh, broadcast. And, you know, that was that was tense for me in a sense, because I grew up thinking certain things about orange men and orange marches and I would have had views on colonization and separation and segregation, all that kind of stuff. And it was a challenge. But what I really got to see in talking to people on an Orange March is that most people there are like most people here in the sense that, you know, obviously that's one side of Derry. The, the, the vast majority of people in Derry would consider themselves nationalists or so on. But um, the Orange community, most of them on an Orange March weren't there to to dump on people or to, to mm. preach hate or anything like that. Um, that that was what they felt was their cultural heritage and it was mostly a day out for families and so on. Now we can argue to toss one or the other on it all but you know it was, it was I think it's important in this day and age to go beyond your comfort zone and to listen and connect with people outside whether they be Muslim Protestant, Catholic whatever they are we're all really looking for the same things in life which is you know a good future for our families and ourselves. Well then coming down through Dublin what was the one of the main things that hit you was homelessness a big one in terms of wow it's it's bad here yeah I suppose coming back into Dublin I felt like the real I was living in Dublin at the time when I set out mind yeah. you and I've since left and the rental crisis was part of the reason we left and um Obviously, that's an ongoing story, and and I would like to think we're going to finally resolve that in the, in the coming months or years. But um, and look, at we could talk about that another time. But um, yeah, Dublin. I mean, homelessness. It's it, like like 
it's just, I mean, what can we say? It's it's, dev, it's it's abominable what's going on and what has been going on. And we, we're we not hearing about homeless people right now, but less people on the streets means less donations. Sometimes charities are finding it harder to fundraise right now, which is important to get behind them. And remember that there are so many vulnerable people, including uh, several thousand people stuck in direct provision right now that can't do social isolation. So mm. there are so many more vulnerable people than myself and others. And I suppose I saw that disparity in Dublin and it reminds me of San Francisco increasingly where you have this huge gap in wealth of just millions and billions floating through the city, whether it be through the Docklands and IFSC and Silicon Valley companies. And then just round the corner, you have a human being, a fellow human being lying on the street you know, destitute, and that's not acceptable in my eyes. It, there's no well, reason. Then let's no take a reason. look at the, pand- at the pandemic that we're supposedly in now. When it ends, which supposedly it will sometime soon, uh, there'll be profound change in people and society, or will there? I mean, for instance, I remember talking to David Byrne from Talking Heads, and he said, uh, God, New York after 9-11, everybody was so cool for about four, maybe five weeks. And then after that, it was back to the usual of everybody being the rudest people in the world and everything else, and taxi drivers barking at you. And he kind of laughed at it and goes, yeah, well, that's the way it is. So, you know, the lessons that we take from all of this and the good from it, is there any way you say you think we could, or that we'll be a different people in three or four or five months' time? I, I don't think there's any inevitable answer to that question, um, whether it be the positive or the negative. I think it's a decision that everybody listening here right now needs to make for themselves. And that then therefore becomes a collective decision as to how we respond. Do we want this to be a fundamental crossroads turning point catalyst for something deeper? Because in my eyes, uh, we talk about going back to normal. Normal in many ways was the freedom to visit our friends and families. And of course, we want that back. And I've just had a new uh, nephew born just a few days ago that I haven't met and I'm not sure when I'll get to meet him. Hello to little Luca Dan and everyone in Spiddle. But, you know, Normal was also a very unequal country, a country with not proper healthcare or housing or services and those people in on the streets and so on. I don't want that Normal. I don't want the Normal where we're going off an ecological cliff. So we were in big trouble anyway. And I think we could seize this moment. I, I genuinely believe I am idealistic about it. And I know that can be dismissed very easily, but we have to believe and we have to be idealistic. But then we need to turn that energy and sentiment into action. And that's where activism comes in and whatever form that might take for people is different. Um, Hitching for Hope is what it's called and it's out now at the moment and it's Rory McKiernan we're talking to here. Power of travel to open up the mind. Now I know the travel you made was in one of about 240 countries in the world just little old Ireland but by the same token did it open up your mind? Yeah I, I think there's something to get out of your comfort zone get out of what I would have felt I was in a rut and to just shake off even just take a bit of time off work if people can. I know that's not always easy, but maybe this is something you lead up to or plan to. But I think get out there and see the world and connect with the world. And that might even just be a weekend adventure, you know, to go camping or hitching and carry. God knows when this madness is all over, I'm certainly going to take to the hills. And I've suggested uh, to friends that I've suggested actually online to everyone that the whole country should go on a collective celebration. We should all go camping together and have a world's biggest bonfire on the hill of Ishnock or somewhere and because uh, we're going to need that out you know we're going to need to let loose a little bit but I do think when you you can we can all get in a rut you know we can all get broken down by life life can be very stressful and challenges and pressures on us and I think travel provides a great way to just loosen up a bit and open your mind and re- even remember who you are as a person I think that applies to all of us sometimes and I think you can also travel on a day-to-day just even by taking a walk and taking time away from your phone and that's something that I need at the moment as well when you're just wired to the news addicted yeah. to your phone all that's, that kind of stuff. Like funny you know a constant theme in the book would it be fair to say I know I started off by using words like whatever they were anger and hardship and injustice and it was what the bankers had done to Ireland kind of answers from a lot of people or a lot of the conversations of people driving cars etc but you know a constant theme in the book is you who nobody knew being looked after yeah 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 you know there's a there's a lot of um traditions and cultures around the world that have an inbuilt um culture of hospitality of kindness and welcome to the stranger. And that goes into the Bible and it goes into various spiritual traditions. 
kindness to the stranger. I think one, I, I can't remember, is it Islam or there's certainly one spiritual tradition where it's the, the, the stranger is God in disguise. Now, I'm not, I'm not personally yeah, yeah. pushing God yeah, yeah. or religion, yeah. but, you know, you just, a stranger could bring a, ga- a great gift for you, a great piece of knowledge or a great question or a great insight or an idea or even provoke you on something. And I think that we can give that to each other. And I really felt that amongst people. I really felt that we, I was being looked after, you know, but there was a reciprocity in as well. I wasn't necessarily trying to give people sure, anything, but of course, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think just that care for each other. Okay, and well, look, the book really itself is called Hitching for Hope. It's called A Journey into Heart and Soul of Ireland. Uh, the author is Rory McKiernan. And Rory, thanks a million for being with us on the programme today. Just one final thing about that. What you wanted to do with this book, I presume, was to both inspire and inform and just you know, this was a weird thing you did and it was just fantastic. That, But is it also to challenge? In other words, would you like people to do what you did? Uh, I would like people to do what I did in whatever way it comes to them, in whatever. I would say, let's all go on an adventure in our life and to make life as beautiful and as courageous as possible. And whatever form that takes for you is up to you. But everyone has a calling and an opportunity and Let's live life. All right. Well, listen, Rory, thanks a million for talking to us on the programme today. And remember, don't just wash your hands, uh, scrub them. Good luck. Take it easy. Hello, Rory here again. Thanks so much for checking out the interview and thanks for all your support, particularly the podcast patrons who've chipped in over at loveandcourage.org and those who've spread the word and rated and reviewed the podcast. And also thanks to everyone who's checked out the book. And if you want to check out the book, Hitching for Hope, you can find links at hitchingforhope.com and it's on available on most of the major uh, online stores at the moment. It'll be officially launched in the US and elsewhere in June, but you can pre-order at the moment. And also all reviews are seriously massively appreciated on Amazon, Google Reads, Goodreads, all those kind of places. Thanks again, folks. Until next time, lots of love and lots of courage to you.